All right, well, please stand with us this morning. We're gonna worship the Lord together. God, we honor and lift you up today. Be glorified, be praised, and we know that your word says that you dwell, in fact, in the midst of the praises of your people. And so, Lord, we thank you so much that you're here even now. We worship you. We lift you high. In Jesus' name, amen. to sing to the Lord together. And there's something so special about singing songs to the Lord, not about the Lord. 
And so as we sing today, I, I, it doesn't slip my mind that people could be in a place like this singing about the Lord without getting before Him and deep crying out to deep in our hearts, the depths of our hearts and our souls, crying out and singing to the Lord and lifting Him high and say, Lord, be glorified and be honored and be worshiped in my life. Not just that He is a refuge, not just that He is a strength, but He is our refuge. He's our strength. And to make it even more personal, He's my refuge and He's my strength and He's my shelter in the storm and through the storm. And this Lord of ours, this good shepherd, this good God, who's our shepherd on the hilltop and he's our shepherd in the valley. And aren't we so thankful that his word doesn't say we walk to the valley, but we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and he's our shepherd even there. And he's our refuge even there. And he's our strength even there. And especially there when we're weak, we're strong in him. And so Lord, our heart's desire is to worship you now not to wait until another opportunity or another moment, but Lord, that everything that has breath would praise the Lord and we're breathing today and we're thankful for this day. And we need you now. We need you every hour and we need you this hour, Lord. And so God, be exalted, be worshiped in this place. In spirit and in truth, in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen.
say, all my life. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am made, I will see of the goodness of God. Just think on the faithfulness of God in your life and let's sing it out. Just be reminded of those moments, those times where you questioned and you realized He's so faithful to you your whole life, that all your life He's been faithful. And let's just sing it. Let's sing it together. Praise our faithful God this morning. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness and your goodness to us. We know that today is no exception to that. And we praise you for it and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, turn around and greet one another. And we'll get into the announcements in just a moment. All right. All right. Well, it is so good to see all of you here today. What a blessing to be able to worship our Lord together. And what a blessing to have this beautiful day outside. And we're thankful for it. Hey, I want to talk about a few things this morning before we get into the announcements. The first is, if you're a guest or visitor here, welcome. Good to see you. My name's Samuel, and I'm the lead pastor here. And we would love for you to stop by our Welcome Center uh, on your way out this morning and fill out a connection card. Let us know who you are or just come introduce yourselves. Uh, we would love, love to get to know you. Thanks so much for spending some time out of your Sunday morning with us today. Um, as far as the announcements go, those are coming, but there's first I want to pray over our service and our tithe and giving and something else. There's four ways to give. That is through our website app. We have giving boxes uh, here in the building and then mail. So we want to pray for that. We're thankful for every gift that God gives in his provision. And uh, one of the things I'll be talking more about in the next couple of weeks is just kind of the next phase as we're expanding our facility a bit. And so we're excited about that work to continue. So on that drop down, there's a tithe and offering, or if you'd like to give towards our expansion project, there's a place there to do that as well. Um, next, I also want to pray because this morning, Pastor Mikey, he's our youth and young adults pastor. He's going to be bringing the word this morning. So we're excited about that. It's going to be great. And he'll continue in our study of 1 Samuel to 1 Samuel chapter 10. Uh, and that is great. I also want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. If you've been following the news uh, over the last uh, 24 to 36 hours, um, there's a lot of activity going on there. And if you haven't heard, uh, yesterday Iran uh, sent around 300 or more missiles over to Israel. Um, thankfully, 99% of those, over 99% of those were intercepted. And so that's a praise, and we know there's been some retaliation. You know, interestingly, we just finished this last Sunday, uh, Pastor Randy Cook just finished this, this series, this on the end times, biblical end times. And so you can look that up on our website and check that out. 
But one of the things that is definitely apparent when you read just about biblical end times is how much attention and intention the Lord has surrounding Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And it's been this conflict for years and years and years. Uh, But what we do know is that the United States has said they will back Israel. And so we know in these retaliatory type things, this could go into a greater conflict. And uh, certainly our country is um, in the mix here. And so I just want to pray. The Bible says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so I want to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But I also want to pray that God would give great wisdom, abundant wisdom to uh, not only world leaders, but uh, the leaders of, of our country, uh, those people, uh, particularly the, the president I want to lift up, that there would be just this wisdom from God that would come to those leaders, but internationally, that the Lord would intervene and pray for that peace. And so uh, that's biblical. The Lord tells us to lift up, to pray for those people who are in leadership and authority. So we're going to do that. And so I'll work my way to that. But if you would just agree with me as we pray, that would be a great blessing. And we know that God is on the throne And uh, Mikey's going to talk about it today, that he gives great peace to those whose minds are stayed on him. So let's just set our minds on him and trust him for that peace. Lord, uh, first, we thank you so much for this church that you've entrusted to us and you've given. Thank you for the body. I thank you for the people that represent this body. And uh, Lord, just the friends and family that we've uh, become. And so, Lord, as we give today, we want to honor you in our giving You're the blesser. You're the giver of all things, all things through you and to you. And so, God, as we give of our first fruits, we pray that it would produce a harvest. Also, we lift up the teaching time today in your word. I pray that that you would speak through your word. And as Mikey delivers your word, that you would speak through him. And, Lord, we want to pray for Israel. We want to pray for Jerusalem. We want to pray for the conflict that's going on. And we want to ask you, Lord, for peace. Peace that surpasses understanding. Peace for those who are there. Peace for those throughout our world. And Lord, peace for us as your people. Lord, we don't always know what to do, but we fix our eyes on you. And we ask, Lord, that you would give wisdom. uh, Wisdom from above to world leaders. We ask that you'd give wisdom to our leaders to know what to do, those people who are put in position of authority in our country. I pray, Lord, that somehow, some way, that your voice would intervene here and that you would give that wisdom that's needed for a time such as this. And God, give us wisdom too and help us to remain peaceful even in the midst of something like this because Our trust is in our Lord, and our God is good. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here's the announcement. Well, good morning, church family. It's wonderful to have all of you joining us here, whether it is online or on site. We have a few announcements for you. And first up, it's our men's barbecue dinner and devotion that's coming up on Friday, April 26th, starting at 6.30 p.m. The cost is $8 per person. And men, you get some very tasty smoked barbecue chicken with some very delicious delicious sides planned for you, as well as a great testimony from Greg Sussbauer and some worship. So make sure, men, that you sign up to come out and join this great fellowship time for all of you on April 26th. You can sign up on the church app, website, or at the church welcome center. And women, we have your tea and brunch that's coming up this Saturday, April 20th from 10.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. The cost is $9 per person. And women, we have some very great brunch options waiting for you. So make sure that you sign up for this wonderful opportunity for us to come together, fellowship with one another, get into some great worship and a devotional from Jess Schmidt. There's going to be child care for ages five and under. So sign up, letting us know that you plan to come by going on our church app or website, or you can head over to our church welcome center. 
Also at the Welcome Center, you will see a sign up for volunteers. So men, if you are interested in helping serve the wonderful ladies of our church at the Women's Tea and Brunch, we'd love to get your sign up and have your help with that. And then women, if you want to help serve the great gentlemen of our church at their barbecue dinner, you can also sign up at the Church Welcome Center. Or you can head over to our church app under the Serving Opportunities tab, and we'd love to have have your help with those events. And lastly, we're looking forward to seeing all of you tonight at 5 p.m. for our night of worship and baptism. We have some great people being baptized tonight, and we are so excited to celebrate this. So make sure that you come on out and you help with this great celebration when they're making this awesome declaration in their life tonight at 5 p.m. right here in the church sanctuary. You're not going to want to miss it. Well, that's all the announcements that we have for you this morning. So let's get into our message. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And that is good news that people are being baptized tonight. So yes, please come out. Yeah, celebrate that. We're excited about that. Decisions and uh, just devotion to the Lord. What a beautiful thing. Uh, so today we'll be in 1 Samuel chapter 10, uh, verses 17 through 27. Today's passage uh, is entitled, well, not in your Bible, but on your, big, on your big screen, Working with God Through Resistance. That's the title of today's message, Working God Through Resistance. And as we think about resistance today, I just want to invite you to think about what is resistance in, in your life right now, in your context, uh, maybe in this season or something that has been apparent in and out in different seasons of life. And this passage today, we're going to see it's kind of an interpersonal resistance. It's, it's a person to person or, or a people group type thing, maybe more of a social systematic type thing. Um, so that's an option on the table. Maybe you have interpersonal or social resistances going on in your life, but maybe it's just other things that are always at the front of your mind when you wake up and when you go to sleep. So just however, whatever context that means for you, I want, to, I want you to I want to invite you to think of resistance that way. <clears throat> now, as we talk about resistance, I want to start with a simple question. Can you think of a time when you faced resistance before? Probably all of us, right? <laughs> the, the silent laughs or the, the low chuckles go, yeah, all of us. <laughs> well, let me ask you another question. In terms of resistance, have you ever run hood to coast? <laughs> That's some resistance for you. <laughs> some bigger smiles there. So if you're not from Oregon or just not familiar, Hood to Coast is a long team relay uh, from Mount Hood, which is east of Portland, all the way to the Oregon coast. And people get their friends and fam family together to do this. And they get a team and they get in a van and they switch off running different legs of this relay. Well, me personally, I have not done Hood to Coast for reasons obvious to me, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you guys laughed a little harder than you should have there. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> so, mm, all right, <laughs> all right, but Hud to Coast does have kind of this mini series leading up to it where they have different races, and uh, I got to compete in one of those, compete, we'll put that in quotes, we'll leave that in quotes. Uh, so I got to compete in one of those relays. Um, a couple of years ago, my brother and his wife asked me and my wife, Lexi, if we want to be on their relay group for, um, for this relay they were running in Hood River. So we decided to join. Now, it's called or it's spelt out the W-I-N-D-Y River Relay. And at the time, I wasn't sure how that first word was pronounced. But you can imagine how it's pronounced has implications for the race. If it's the windy river relay, then okay, I can be ready for some curves, that, nah, no big deal. But if it's the windy river relay, <laughs> we got some more work to do. So my brother and his wife are really good runners. Not so much here. I didn't get that, that long distance gene. Uh, knowing this, they took the longest legs of the relays and left the shorter ones for us who are less distance inclined. In all, I ran two legs, uh, one about four and a half miles and one about six and a half miles. So I ran about 11 miles in this day, but my four and a half mile 
leg was the very first leg of the day for the whole race. So I'll set the scene for you. And remember, this is my, my first time doing this, so I'm into it. It was early morning, and before the sun had even come up, we're at the starting line with the, with the first heat, with the first group that's going to go. Like we said, sun hasn't even risen yet, so I had my headlamp on. I had my neon vest on. I'm ready to go. The announcer calls our group to the starting line, and I look around my group and who I'm going to be running this first leg with, and... I noticed one thing. I'm the only man in this group. So in my, man, I'm, in my mind, I'm going, oh, man, how long before these ladies whoop me in this race? When's that sheet going to drop? And the announcer continues to give us the countdown. One minute, you know, 30 seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds, four. What do I do? Reach in my pocket. Take a shot of my inhaler, put it back in my pocket. I'm ready to go. He says, go. And we take off. It was funny because my brother didn't know I had like a sports asthma, the one who asked me to do this race. And he sees that. And the last thing I see before I take off is him going, wait, what? <laughs> and I just take off. Uh, so for the first couple of miles, I was hanging in there. Uh, to my surprise, I was kind of in the front middle of the pack, and I'm thinking, okay, I can, I can pace with these folks for now. I'm going to try to keep pace with them, because so so, I don't know how long what the pace should be for this whole race, so I'm just trying to keep pace. I was surprised that I actually hung on for a couple of miles, and then, every good story has a, and then, and then there was this hill. The hill, the humble maker of all people. <laughs> the hill is where the pack starts to separate out. And this hill will let you know who's been training for this race and who hasn't been training as ardently. Uh, this wasn't just, it wasn't just a little hill. It was like, you guys ever watch those movies of San Francisco, those real steep? Yeah, it was like that. But in my mind, we're on Mount Hood, but it looks like Mount Everest to me. So we hit this hill, and the pack starts separating out. The distance between one another gets longer. Be things become more obvious. A lot of runners at this time become walkers. Do oblige. Uh, at this point, um, on this hill is when your legs start to burn. You start feeling that lactic acid build building up. It feels like gravity has turned up five notches on you. What am I describing? I'm describing resistance. The resistance is picking up. Then when we get up to the hill, it gets out of this kind of the city neighborhood and it takes us turn to the right on kind of this country road and it's kind of this flat, flat plain land up there. It's flat and it's wide open, and which is the good news and the bad news at the same time. Can you guess why it's the good news? It's flat, no more hills. Can you guess why it's the bad news? It's flat, yes, for all my meteorologist friends out there. But flat surface is a surface where wind gusts pick up, right? So I'm running this thing, and this wind really starts going. And I don't know if you've had this experience. Have you ever been running, and it just feels like the wind is a person just pushing you backwards? I just feel like there are hands on my chest pushing me the opposite direction. As I'm trying to push forward, I remember thinking this. Yep, it's windy. It's called the Windy River Relay. <laughs> Answers my question from the beginning. Is this the Windy River or the Windy River? This is the Windy River Relay we're in. I knew right there, mid-race. The Windy River Relay gave me a lot of resistance on that day. Did I think about quitting? No, honestly, yeah. <laughs> of course it crossed my mind, but it wasn't something that I entertained too long. Why didn't I entertain quitting too long? I might not have known it at the time, but in reflection, I think two major words come into play. Trust and accountability. I trusted that after my 11 miles, there was going to be something greater. There's a bigger goal that we're striving forward. There's a celebration. There's a meal. Uh, there's camaraderie. There's this sense of accomplishment. We did this together. I pushed myself beyond where I thought my limit was. I was pushing to something greater. There's trust that there's something greater on the other side. 
And then what about accountability? I couldn't quit because I was accountable to my teammates. The nature of a relay is you're not in it alone. You're in it with friends. You're in it with family. And if I wanted to not let them down, I had to finish my leg of the race so they could finish theirs. Accountability, thinking about another. An appreciation for, a care for, a consideration for can keep us moving forward in the face of resistance. Today, we're gonna read about resistance to God within the nation of Israel. And we're gonna see how Samuel trusted the Lord in the midst of that resistance and how Saul showed accountability in the midst of that resistance. So I just wanna set the stage a little bit, give a little context of background for this story. So up to this point, Israel had been governed by judges. Samuel, who we read about in this passage, was um, he was a judge and he was a prophet of God to his people. As Samuel's getting old, he makes his son judges too, his sons judges too. But were they good judges or bad judges? His son, yes, his sons ended up being bad judges. And here's the thing, it wasn't bad judges because like they forgot the rules. They were bad judges on purpose. They knew the rules, they knew the boundaries, they knew the law, and they chose to transgress them for their own building up of their own personal wealth or pride or whatever it might be. The scripture tells us that they took bribes and the scripture actually says they perverted justice. And their job is to be the one who makes the ruling on right or wrong. And they're approaching it from an angle that is perverse in itself. So the people of Israel get sick of this and they turn to Samuel and they say, hey, here's the deal. You're getting older and we don't trust your sons for one second. We want to have a king like the other nations have a king. This grieves Samuel and he goes to talk to the Lord about it. And the Lord tells him this, Samuel, listen to the people. Obey what they say to you. They haven't rejected you. It's me that they've rejected as their king. (sighs) What a terrible sentiment. Let that not be us. Let us live our lives in a way that glorifies him as our king, not rejects him. So the people aren't happy with God as their king. So they want to have an earthly king like the pagan nations around them. And they want it now. They want it to be like the surrounding nations. This is God's nation that he called to be set apart to him. What about us? Can we look around and look at different things and use discernment and say, not for me, not for me, not for me. Not for me and my brothers and sisters in Christ. God set us aside for him. God set us aside for service for him. They rejected God and his plan for their best. Why? Because they wanted it their way. They wanted their preferences and they wanted their preferences now. Samuel, go talk to God. Let's get this thing changed over. New way of doing things. But you tell God for us. <laughs> so the Lord sends them. Uh, so the Lord sends Samuel back, but he sends Samuel with a warning. And the warning says, fine. If it's a king you want, it's a king I'll give you. But you'll see that this king is going to be a harsh ruler. It ain't what you thought it's going to be. And he kind of alluding to us that, you know what, it's far better to wait for God's perfect plan and God's perfect timing. The plan was for there to be a king in time, but they're asking for it on their terms. They're asking for a king now instead of waiting for God to bring the one that he had in hand the whole time. So they reject God's plan and God's best for them because they wanted their preferences now. But still, the people don't care uh, that this king is going to be harsh or, or what the Lord has said to them about the king being harsh. They go on, give us a king. We want a king. They go on with their demands. So God tells Samuel about a man that he has a plan to anoint as king. This man's name is Saul. That's who we meet uh, here in chapters 9 and 10. When we meet Saul, 
Saul actually seems humble. Some might even say he seems really tim- timid. Uh, Samuel tells him that you're going to be anointed king. And this is Saul's response in chapter nine, verse 21. Am I not a Benjamite from the least of the tribes of Israel? And is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribes of Benjamin? Why have you spoken to me in this way? Why have you spoken to me in this way? It can't be me. I'm not qualified. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin and I'm the least of these in the tribe of Benjamin. That's how he sees himself. It can't be me. What a beautiful thing when we realize sometimes God does things in a way that when it's done, no human can have glory for it. Sometimes God works through you or through your circumstances in a way that we couldn't concoct or manipulate, twist and turn. Sometimes God works in a way where you get to the end, you go, I couldn't have pulled that off. That means it's only God, all glory be to God. Saul did not anticipate being king. It wasn't even on his radar. He thought he had every reason to be counted out. But God shows Samuel that Saul is the one he has chosen to be the first king of Israel. At the beginning of chapter 10, Saul's anointed for the throne privately by Samuel. It says Samuel pours oil on his head. And he tells him that God's anointed him to be prince over Israel, prince, the one who will become king. The scripture says God made Saul a new man and gave him a new heart. This is at the front end of Saul's story here. So God locates this man, this man who thinks he's not even close to being qualified for this position, and God readies him from the inside out. He gives him a new heart, and it sets Saul's trajectory like this. And that's what we'll see in this passage. Now, unfortunately, if you know the rest of the story, Saul's trajectory turns downward. And maybe this is even a lesson to us, to treat so delicately any newness, any freshness, that God puts in our hearts to hold on to that, to walk in his ways, to not shun them for our own cares in time, now or in time. But let's always hold precious the new things that he's doing in us and doing in others. And let's be sensitive to those things. They're not there to puff us up. But God will work good things in us so we can point to him. You'll see in Saul's story, the finger goes from pointing to God to himself, and that's when it turns downward. We're not there yet, though. But the scripture says, God made Saul a new man and gave him another heart. This is a beautiful thing. The Holy Spirit rushed on Saul, and he even began to prophesy at this point in front of the people. And the people were surprised. And they were saying publicly, is Saul among the prophets? Wait, what is this? Is Saul among the prophets? They were confounded. Maybe they weren't used to seeing Saul hang out with the religious enthusiasts. Or maybe they're just used to see him playing the background and never stepping into the limelight. Whatever it was, this was full evidence that Saul stepped into a new area of life that God had for him. And God made him ready for it. And this is where we pick up in verse 17 of chapter 10. Saul is publicly proclaimed king in front of the nation. So 1 Samuel 10, 17 through 19, if you have your Bible. Now Samuel called the people together to the Lord at mitzvah. He calls the nation together. He says, all right, y'all, come on, we got to meet. And he said to the people of Israel, thus says the Lord. So he's saying, listen to what the Lord says to you. Listen to what the God of Israel says to you. The Lord says, I brought you up Israel out of Egypt. And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God who saves you from your calamities and from your distresses. And you have said to him, set a king over us. Now therefore present present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Point number one for today is this. 
remember to remember God's faithfulness. And that's not a typo. Remember to remember God's faithfulness. To me, it seems as if the people had forgotten what God had done for them in the past. And that's when they lose a reverence for his power, for his holiness, for where he should be stationed in their lives. And in doing so, they start to stray from their well. And they start down this have it my way trail and it gets further and further and more resistance is built up in the nation. Remember, we must remember to remember how God has been faithful to us in our lives and biblically. Sometimes our hardships though can be so heavy that we forget to appreciate how God brought us through those hardships. A lot of times it's easy to remember the hurtful things in life the Windy River Relay. (laughs) Sometimes it's easy to remember the surprising things in life, even the funny things in life. But we need to make a habit of remembering how we have seen God move in our lives and how we've seen God move in scripture. If we forget to remember, it becomes easy to lose appreciation for him. It becomes easy to lose trust for him, to lose honor for him to lose a, lose a knowledge of his power in our lives. In this scene, God appointed Saul as king and he reminds the people that they have forgotten his goodness and power. As God is telling the Israelites they'll have another king, he also tells them, but I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. Remember? I'm the one who freed you from the kingdoms, plural, that oppressed you. Remember that? but today you've rejected me. You've rejected the very one who saves you from your distresses. You've rejected and you've tried to push to the side the very one who has advocated for you against your oppressors. You have rejected the very one who has saved you out of your hardships. God reminds them that he's the one who's protected them and their rejection of him is their own decision. It's not his doing. It makes no sense to reject the Savior, does it? But they do it anyway. How much for us today? It makes no sense to reject the Savior or to turn to ourselves when he's made himself so available to us. A couple of weeks ago, we had our Easter services. A few weeks ago, maybe at this point. And this is where we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. How he sacrificed his life for our souls. How he saves us. Many believers today know that Jesus did a tremendous thing giving them life, but it can be easy to forget the severity of the sacrifice that Jesus went through to give us that life and the severity of his love to choose to save us. In my work as a jail chaplain, um, the inmates ask me to show them a movie. In the jails, they can write and send what, what we call a kite. It's a service request form. They can write their message and send it to medical, send it to administration, send it to the chaplains, send it to the lieutenant. They can write a kite and send a request. So one day, I get a kite on my desk saying, will you come in and show us the movie, The Passion of the Christ? <sighs> okay. I'm not going to ignore that. So we get it set up. We get it organized. And when I walk to the dorm, I knock on the door and the officer swivels around in her chair, opens the door and says, they're waiting for you. Mm-hmm. This, this particular dorm had 79 beds. Its capacity was 79 men can sleep in there to one officer. And as I look at the TV and we're watching the movie, I counted around 50 chairs. You're telling me in Portland, Oregon, West Coast, Portland, Oregon, in the jails, the majority of these inmates are looking to see what the Savior has done for them. They're looking to see some sense of reality or or some sense of, uh, to be able to acknowledge and apprehend or comprehend 
the Savior who saved them for their, for their sins, the very sins that maybe put them in the, in the jail in the first place, and all the other sins in their lives. So we got it. Uh, I'm walking into the dorm, and they say, we got it all set up, chaplain. Here's the remote. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to go to the closet and get the cords. They had it. They were ready. They were waiting for me. All I had to do was pop in the DVD at that point. So I told the men that this is the closest depiction that we have of Christ's suffering, but it still doesn't capture how tremendously awful that physical beating was. I gave them the warning, and then I sat down, and I watched the film with them. When the movie was over, many men came and shook my hand. Thank you, chaplain. Thank you, chaplain. They had a better idea of what God had done for them on their behalf, the extent that he goes giving his skin to save theirs. I remember a couple of people saying this, man, that was gruesome. My answer, yeah, that's how God sees sin. To remember God's sacrifice is to appreciate the extent of what he did, the extent of what he took on. It's easy to think that sin is tri trivial at times. We find ourselves thinking things like, it's just a little white lie. Nobody's going to care. Or it's all right if no one finds out or no one's looking or, well, mama don't know, don't hurt her. <laughs> Those sins that we think are little sins would separate us from a holy and pure and just God forever if his son didn't take death for us. To God, no sin is minor. No sin in our lives is not worth him sending his son to shed blood. Every step we take, everything is covered under the blood. That's the severity of sin and that's the severity of God's love for us that Christ would have to suffer like that to give us freedom. That's why I love about Resurrection Sunday so much, a day when all Christians around the world stop to remember a God who is great, a God who is saves, and a God who has victory on our behalf. Realizing that, appreciating that, will give a, per a person pur purpose to live every day. Knowing the cost that he paid so we can be free will lead us to restore broken relationships. It'll make serving him a joy and not a chore. And now an appreciation for his saving love should bleed through us to others. Because he forgave, we can forgive others. Because he had mercy on us, we can have mercy on others. Because he had compassion on us, we can extend compassion to others. Because he saved us, we should want others to be saved too. And in that, that'll help me guard how I walk and talk so that they too may know the wonderful King and Savior who saved me from my own sin. Our appreciation for what God leads uh, our appreciation for God leads us to live worshipfully unto him, worshipful with our words and our conversations, with our songs, with our actions, with our hearts. My question for you is, do you live a worshipful lifestyle with your life? If the answer is yes, I would say it's probably because you have an appreciation, a strong appreciation for what the Lord has done for you. The Israelites forgot to appreciate God. Their worship ceased and their rejection for him grew. J.I. Packer says this, we need to discover all over again that worship is natural to the Christian as it was to the godly Israelites who wrote the Psalms and that the habit of celebrating the greatness and graciousness of God yields an endless flow of thankfulness, joy, and zeal. When we realize what he has done for us, that will overflow through us and it will bleed into the hurting world around us. 
chapter 10, verses 20 through 25. Then Samuel brought all of the tribes of Israel near, and the tribes of Benjamin was taken by Lot. And he brought the tribes of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clans of, of the Matrites were taken by Lot. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he couldn't be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, behold, he's hid himself among the baggage. <laughs> then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, he was taller than all the people from his shoulders upward. And Samuel said to the people, do you see whom the Lord has chosen? There is none among, there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, long live the king. Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of kingship. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Then Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his own home. Uh, this, this passage is kind of comical because Samuel gathers them around and he already knows who the king is gonna be, but they, the, the tribe cast lots or the nation cast lots. What is casting lots is kind of this thing of chance. We might think of it like who draws a shorter straw? It's a way to select. And we see that God providentially works through this to confirm that, Sa that Saul is the one to be chosen. The lot falls on Saul from among the whole nation, the one that God had already had anointed. So the people go, all right, Saul, come on forward, receive your crown. Crickets. Saul? Saul, where's Saul? Okay, let's go pray to the Lord again. Lord, where's Saul? Uh, Saul's over there hiding among the luggage. <laughs> and so it says, the guys go over, they grab Saul and bring him forward. And you can get this idea of this humble man who does not want to be center stage, who was hiding. They stand him up and he stands head and shoulders above everybody. And then the people yell, long live the king, long live the king. Point number two for today is this. When faced with resistance, lay your circumstances in the Lord's hands. So the king is presented. Long live the king. Long live the king. And then verse 25, did you catch this? Then Samuel told the people the rights and duties of kingship, and he wrote them in a book and laid them before the Lord. What does laying your circumstances at the Lord's hand mean to you? Let's think about that. What does it mean and what it doesn't mean? Laying things at the hands of, of God doesn't mean that we just totally withdraw and walk away and say, I have no responsibility in the matter. What it does mean is this, as modeled by Samuel. We do the work God asked us to do. We take it to him in prayer. We leave it in, in his hands to sort out and we trust it in his hands and we accept whatever he decides is best. Maybe that's reconciliation of a relationship. If a relationship is just too na nasty and too wicked and there's no reconciliation, maybe it's agreeing to disagreeing and forgiving and letting them loose out of your heart. Maybe it's when he's directing you in, in business and there's a decision to be made or a, a decision to be avoided and so on and so on. Fill in the blank, whatever the example may be in your life. But Samuel did the work that God placed him in position to do. And then he laid the whole situation at God's hands. He was diligent. He didn't just say, God's in your hands and use that as a cop out to check out completely. He says, Lord, I'll do my part and I'm, and I'm trusting you. It might go how I think and it might not. I'm trusting you. Samuel wrote the entire manual explaining how the ruler, the king, and the subjects of the land were supposed to behave because this was new to this nation. Samuel wrote the guidelines and laid them before the Lord. It's the sense of, here it is, Lord, at your service. Do with it what you wish. Or even, I commit these things to you. He didn't continue to argue with the people that he was upset with. He left them to the hands of the Lord as well. What does this look like in your life right now? What situations do you need to leave in the Lord's hands? Is there someone you can think of and you go, oh, I just can't wait till they find out the truth or I can't wait to prove them wrong or I can't wait to see the look on their face when they realize I was right. I'm gonna ask you right now in your heart, 
Just set them free. Just set them free. Set your heart free. Don't carry that grudge. Turn, pray, turn them over to the Lord. Maybe it's something else like there's a financial burden that you're up against. And I know this one's not easy. I want to encourage you, keep doing the work. Put in the hours at your job. Be consistent, budget your income, and continue, continue, continue to pray for God's provision in your situation. Matthew 6, 26 says this. Jesus tells his disciples, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Whatever resistance you're facing right now, I'm gonna encourage you to keep looking up. I have a really short story about a man who was having a really tough day and he just needed to keep looking up. So there's this man, it's not a true story, by the way. There's this man who was kayaking and he looks down and he sees this alligator and he goes, oh man, that's an alligator. I gotta get out of here. The alligator chases him to the shoreline. So he has to outrun the alligator. He finally creates this distance, hood to coast style. He creates this distance and he's catching his breath. <sighs> okay, I'm safe. But he hears something out of his ear. He looks up and there's a tiger roaring and this tiger starts chasing him. So the man sees the tiger and he takes off and he's booking it and he's looking and there's this cliff ahead of him and he has to make a decision. Cliff, tiger, cliff, tiger. So the man looks over the edge of the cliff and he sees a branch hanging about 10 feet down. He jumps down, catches the branch. The tiger looks at him, turns around and walks away. Leaves the scene, but the man doesn't know it because he can't see the top of the branch. The man feels some sense of temporary reprieve. <sighs> okay, okay, I'm good for right now. As soon as he says that, he looks up and he sees a mouse come out of the rocks and the mouse starts chewing on the branch. <laughs> And this man finally goes, okay, I got to try something else. And he looks up to the sky and he says, Lord, I know we haven't talked in a while, but if you're there, can you hear me? And the Lord says, yes, I can hear you. And the man replies, great, I need a little bit of help here. The Lord says, okay, are you willing to do what I'm going to ask you to do? And the man says, yes. The Lord says, climb up the rock and just go back to the cliff top. The Lord knows the tiger is left, but the man doesn't. So it's silence. He doesn't answer. The Lord repeats himself, climb up the rock and go to the cliff top. More silence. The next thing you hear is the man say, is there anyone else up there I can talk to? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but it can be easy. The point is this. It can be easy for us to call out to God in times of resistance. Um, but it takes more head and heart work on our part to follow through with what, the, what God says. To realize that he sees the playing field far better than we do. His perception is here when ours is only what we can see. What does faith do? Faith allows us to recognize we can only see this, but I can trust my God who advocates for me. This is what Samuel had, this trust in God. I'm going to go forward with your call, even in the face of this resistance, knowing that you have the right way and the right path. This is how we can be built up in peace. Sometimes it's easy for us, though, to lean back just on our own understanding. Our, our, our circumstances seem so pressing and so intense that our first reaction isn't even to go to the Lord with this. It's, no, I can fix this right now. I can get out of this. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Seek the one who has higher wisdom. Seek the one who sees the whole plane. When we stop trusting God's wisdom, that's when we start making ourselves the rulers of our own lives. That's when we become like the nation of Israel in this story here. Give us a king. We want to do it our way.
It's our life. We're calling the shots now. And what does that do? That pushes God, the true Savior, to the side. Instead, we should learn to trust like Samuel, who lays his circumstances in the hands of God, the God of victory, the God of salvation, the God of love, the God of care, the God of the one who sees us through the battle. My last point for today is this. Number three, hold your peace through resistance. Verse 26 and 27. Saul also went to his home in Gibeah, and with him went men of valor whose hearts had been touched by God. And then the scripture says this, verse 27, but some, some worthless fellows <laughs> said, how can this man save us? And they despised him. They despised Saul. And they brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So everyone else and people in the nation are bringing presents and they decide not to. And it says, in the face of all this insult, Saul holds his peace. Saul has this life-changing moment as he's, proclaimed clean, as he's proclaimed king. It's a huge victory. It's a huge milestone. And the people cheer him on and they start chanting something that they've probably been wanting to chant for years. Long live the king. Long live the king. But right away, right after Saul gets his blessing, he's met with resistance. He's met with an attack. The scripture tells us that these worthless fellows start publicly talking trash about Saul. How can he save us? What can he do? Follow him? What? Not only do they disrespect Saul, but in doing so, they're questioning God's picking and selection of Saul. Their resistance had bred more resistance in their hearts. And they're snowballing to a way further and further away from the heart and will of God. The worthless men refused to bring Saul his gifts in a way to publicly upstage him. Saul had a few choices on how he'd respond. And my message for us today is this. We all have a few choices on how we can respond in these moments. Saul could have lashed back at them or he could have kept moving past their petty resistance, past this distraction. An insecure and an unwise leader might have done just that. He might have said, I'm going to crush these people under my feet. I'm going to show them who's boss. Or they might have just said, okay, noted, well noted, and just makes them an enemy for the rest of their life, which does what? It only enslaves their own heart. Or there's option three, and Saul exercises option three to keep one's peace in the face of personal resistance. These men try to discredit Saul in front of his nation, but Saul keeps his peace. That phrase keeps his peace in the Hebrew literally translates as he was deaf and he was silent. He was deaf and he was silent to his accusers. The men try to discredit him, but he made his ears deaf to them. He chose not to hear them. He chose to treat it like, I'm unfazed. I don't even hear what y'all saying. And he didn't dignify them with the response. His answer to their vain slander is silence. He said, I'm not even going to let that in here. If we can learn this resolve... This resolve that Saul has, and I think has a changed heart from God, that maybe we can walk more peacefully among the resistance in our lives. What things are we just going to tune out? What things say, yeah, that needs my attention, or I need to clean that up, or what do we just say, that is just a lie from hell, I'm tuning that out. How was Saul able to do this? How can we do this? I believe Saul was able to do it because he knew that he had already been established by God Almighty. God established me. God anointed me. God made me king. Where are y'all going to say to throw me off? He knew he was secure in God. God had touched his heart and God had surrounded him by men whose heart God had touched. In this, Saul was able to shun the slander of the evildoers of these uh, worthless fellows. And he was able to walk away unfazed. Saul 
tuned them out completely. Didn't even give them a court date. <laughs> he just said, nope, and just turned that accusation down. He didn't lose sleep over the lies that the enemy was trying to attach to them. Saul had security in knowing that he had been selected by God. And if you are a believer and a follower of Christ sitting here today, you can have security knowing that you are hand-selected by God. No matter what any adversary, what worthless fellow, what bully at school or in business or in the streets, no matter what anyone says about you, can take away what God says about you. God says, my child is the righteousness of God justified by their faith in Jesus. My child is beautifully and wonderfully made. No lie of the enemy can overcome God's truth in our hearts if we don't let it. But what's our job? To tune that out. Recognize the lies. Tune them out and turn to God's truth. You can make the decision to be deaf to the lies of the enemy, the world, and others are about Christians. When you let your life be ruled by God instead of by the enemy's lies, then you can go in peace. You can choose to speak truth. You can choose to speak to the truth and stay silent to the lies, to the gossip, and to the slander. Isaiah 26 verses 3 and 4 says this. He says to the Lord, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Lord, I want that peace. Then keep your mind on me. Lord, I want that peace. Then trust in me. But did you hear what they say? Hey, hey, bring your mind back on me. But do you know what they're gonna do if I, do? hey, hey, keep your mind on me. That's, why we're, that's where we find peace that surpasses all understanding. Not in the noise and the lies of, of the world, but in the truth of our God, creator of the entire universe, the one who defines and creates truth, what he says about us. Saul held his peace amid this resistance. We see that Saul started with great promise. He was chosen and anointed by God. He was given a new heart. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was supported by great men. He was given gifts as royalty. He was enthusiastically supported by his nation. He was surrounded by valiant men whose, whose hearts God had touched. And he was wise enough to re not regard every doubter as a critic and an enemy. There are some we just gotta let him go. <laughs> Sorry, I got enough of my life. I can't hold your hostility. <laughs> Sometimes we just gotta tune it down. One commentator says this, despite all these great advantages, Saul could, still, uh, Saul could still end badly. He had to choose to walk in the advantages God gave him and choose not to go his own way. The rest of the book of 1 Samuel shows how Saul dealt with that choice. We learn that Saul didn't handle his choices well as time progressed. He abandoned the new heart God had shaped in him as he got prideful. Let that not be us. Let us treat the change that God makes in us and in our hearts as delicate, as precious, and let's continue to choose him every day and walk into the newness of heart that he gives his believers. Let's choose him every day again and again. Center his will and not ours. I just want to finish with these words right here or, or this question. Do you find yourself running against resistance? Do you feel like things in your life are just pushing against your chest while you're trying to move forward and they're pushing and trying to move you backwards? If that's you today, I want to encourage you to look up to the Lord. Keep looking up. Lay your circumstances in his hands. Keep your peace when the resistance wants to break you down. Tune out the hate. Tune out the lies tune out the false labels, and tune up God's word in your life. Seek the Lord in all circumstances and let the God of peace rule in your heart and in your mind. Let's pray together. 
Father, I just pray that we can do that, that we can learn just to let the God of peace rule in our hearts and in our minds and that we can tune down the hate of the enemy. Any words that come up against us, Father, if there's validity there, I ask that we can grab that and even lay that in front of you. Father, help us to go forward journeying through in truth and in appreciation for you, Father. If there's anyone here who hasn't made the Lord, uh, who hasn't made Jesus the Savior of their life, I just want to invite you to do that right now. If that's you, I'm just going to invite you just to look up here. If you've come here and you're saying, yes, I want that. Amen. 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 If that's you, I just invite you to repeat this prayer. Father, uh, thank you for sending your son to die for my sins. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross so that I may have eternity with you in heaven. I make you the Lord and Savior of my life right now and eternally, and I choose to walk with you. If you've made that prayer, um, I encourage you to continue to go forth seeking him daily. After conversion, there's discipleship, being a follower of Christ, choosing him and trusting him with your life. And Father, for everyone else in here who, um, who's just struggling with some sort of resistance as they hear your word, let them find that peace is only found in your presence Peace is only given, true peace is only given by the God of peace. And I pray that the God of peace, you, Lord, just interrupt the noise in their life, bring calm to their hearts, and show them the way to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand with us. We're going to close in worship.
as you go from this place. We're looking forward to seeing you guys back here tonight for our baptism service. Let's go. Until then, be blessed. Love you guys.